I would like to bring back to you once again, uh, a lot of you probably remember Erica Henry uh, started out with our healthcare coalition, moved on to the State Department of Health, and now she's here to tell us about all the great work she's doing at the state level. Thank you. Um, before I start, Randy, Dell, I'm so happy to see you here today. Um, I'm going to be back for hugs before I, I go. Thank you for being here. I'm going to miss Bill a lot. I know we all will. Um, okay, hi, I'm Erica Henry um, with the Washington State Department of Health. I'm um, really happy to be here speaking with you today. As uh, Ed mentioned, I, I got my roots in this work uh, right here at this Healthcare Coalition. And I want to correct something that Ed said um, about Travis. Um, <laughs> you don't know how lucky you are that I left and that you have Travis. He has taken this coalition way far beyond uh, where I would have been able to do it because he brings such a fabulous skill set and knowledge base and energy to this work. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that you guys are super lucky that Travis is here. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about statewide priorities for healthcare preparedness. Do we have a quick? Oh yeah. Okay. Um, have I already gone wrong? I'm struggling with a slide pointer. What did I do wrong? Oh, wait. I've done it. Okay, so I'm going to start just with a few slides. I want to build a little bit of context. I want to build a framework for our presentation before I dive into some sort of like the more heavy hitting stuff. Um, so we just went through a kind of an extensive strategic planning process just in our little emergency preparedness and response division um, at DOH, so Emergency Preparedness and Responses, EPR. Anyway, so we identified these four values for ourselves, and the reason I think it's important for you to know is because I want you to understand where we're operating from in our work. So we value excellence, that we have skills and knowledge. We value flexibility, and this is about creative solutions and being um, easily adaptable to new circumstances, which we always find ourselves in um, despite our best efforts. At, at, not doing that. Um, we value teamwork. We want to help each other as much as we can, and we value stewardship. So we really believe in being good stewards of the resources uh, that we're entrusted with, and that's the federal funds and the people that we have on our team. So we have some strategic plan focus areas, and again, I want to review these, these because I hope you will see these reflected in some of the slides I'm going to show you today, and I hope you will continue to see these reflected in the work that you experience from DOH, Emergency Preparedness and Response. I'm not here talking about all of DOH, right, I just like my little sliver of the world. So we want to keep getting better. This is through our corrective action program and trainings and that type of stuff, professional development. We want to support our people. Um, we're really working on a culture of recognition. Uh, we want to be a whole community leader, and that gets at cult being culturally and linguistically appropriate during our responses and really focusing on health equity, uh, response and recovery. This is the group I'm a part of, obviously. Um, talking about the agency support, what it means to be a response agency and not just say, like, yeah, we show up when things go wrong, but to really institutionalize that in our agency, and then uh, sustainability. So that gets at our statewide response teams. Uh, we have an internship program that we're growing, and of course, uh, how do we keep doing this work without money? I don't, if you have ideas, um, let me know. Okay, so you're sitting there wondering, great, that's about DOH, but what's in it for me, right? So what does that look like for me in Garfield County, in Columbia County, in Spokane County? So what I hope it looks like for you is that there's a DOH that understands the needs and challenges of local and regional planning, and that strives to identify or create resources that advance our collective readiness and response capabilities. To me, this sounds a lot 
like what Chandra just talked about, right? We're not an emergency management agency, but we have an emergency response function. And so we work a lot in that resource area and in that incident support area alongside with our emergency management partners. For us, that would be the state emergency management division and all of the jurisdictional emergency managers across the state. Okay, so that's what I'm hoping is in it for you. Okay, so whatever, but what does that actually look like, right? So I wanna just review some activities of what this looks like in practice. So here's some recent incident management team activities. So we have this incident management team at DOH. We actually have three of them, maybe four, um, and uh, they get activated when there's something interesting going on. So here's some interesting stuff that's happened recently. Uh, we sent some IMT members to be actors for a community reception center at an exercise at the Columbia Generating Station. Seems boring, but that's gonna come up again in a future slide. We activated for months. Um, we were active during the wildfire season. We filled some resource requests. And I wanna focus on these last two bullets. We had a, some requests for air purifiers. Those requests were not fulfilled because through further vetting of the request, what we learned was our air purifiers would not service the square footage of the room that they were going to be used in. And so I hope you've heard this a thousand times before, but I'm gonna say it again. When you need a resource, you should always describe your problem. Don't ask for the thing you think you need. Describe the problem because the resources that could solve that problem are probably far greater than you even really need to know about. So what you need to say is, I need an air purifier for like this really big room or give like an exact square footage. Then let the emergency management folks find the resources to fit that need. If we hadn't asked qualifying questions here, we would have sent air purifiers to this like super big room and they would have plugged them in and thought that they were like in this really purified air, but they weren't, right? So we need to vet resource requests and you can really help that by focusing on describing your problem. Okay, here's some more IMT stuff. This is actually really cool. I mean, Hurricane Harvey wasn't really cool, but what was cool was that Texas needed a lot of help and they reached out specifically to the Washington State Department of Health because they knew about our incident management team capability. And so we deployed four members of our incident management team to Austin, Texas to help with this uh, response. That included Michael Lair. He's the chief of emergency preparedness and response. He's my boss. He's the guy Travis was hoping to get here today. And he really wanted to be here, but he had some conflicts on his schedule. He just couldn't make it. So you're stuck with me because I live like five minutes away. So um, I'm going to try to do us justice at DOH though. So they assisted with incident management functions, information gathering, situational awareness, um, and resource requests. This was the largest and most complex healthcare response in this country since the 1918 pandemic. It was really a big deal. And so for DOH to be recognized as having the capability to respond to that, um, for me, is a big feather in the cap of the work that has been done over the past several years. So here's some upcoming IMT stuff. I'm sure you, if you haven't, heard of tranquil terminus, don't worry about it, it's this big Ebola thing. But uh, that's gonna be happening in a few weeks, so we're gonna activate for that. Um, on October 31st, there's a radiation exercise. This is why I mentioned a few slides back that we sent some, uh, some IMT members to be actors at the Community Reception Center. So the Columbia Generating Station is, uh, has to have FEMA-evaluated exercises every so often. And so they're having one of those evaluated exercises next spring. Because the Department of Health incident management team is now part of their response, the incident management team is now part of the evaluation process by the FEMA evaluators. So Columbia Generating Station actually stands to lose their certification if we screw this up. We really don't want to screw this up, right? But um, it's, it's, again, more... Uh, I don't know, evidence demonstration of our IMT is doing really good work and we're ready to respond to help your jurisdiction, to help this region, to help any region in the state during an emergency response. So I mentioned that we have two or maybe three, I don't know, four um, incident management teams at DOH. There's one that is growing uh, to serve Eastern Washington. We have a DOH satellite office near the Spokane Valley Mall. Uh, and the, yeah, the IMT out of that office is called the Steelhead Team. We are looking for members to flesh out that roster for the Steelhead Team. If 
you're interested in an in incident management position in training that would make you proficient in that position, please contact this guy. His name is Tim, Tim McClung at doh.wa.gov. He actually uh, also lives here in Spokane. We'll provide the training, we'll provide the response experience, and we'll call on you to be part of the DOH incident management team uh, response if you're interested. Uh, you'll have access to these slides afterwards, so don't worry about writing anything down. All right, so we talked about some capabilities that DOH is developing. Uh, just real quick, I want to introduce MODS. It's the Modular All Hazards Deployable System. Uh, there's a picture on the next slide. So uh, this is a, a mobile unit, think of like a really big shelter or a tent, you'll see it in a minute, that can be requested as a whole entire thing or just in pieces to serve the needs of, of the response. We have a task force at Department of Health that will come ship this thing, they'll set it up, they'll demobilize it, they'll take it back. They won't staff it. Um, that has to come from uh, local folks who are also responsible for all of the wraparound services to support the operation of this thing. But this is a great resource um, if you need shelter or alternate care space. Actually, the next slide goes over like 15 different uses for this thing. But um, you don't know what like the 1935 shelter systems are. Don't worry about it. I just wanted to sort of give a sense of how massive this thing is. It's super huge. And it has its own HVAC systems and air scrubbers and the whole shebang. So um, a really excellent deployable asset uh, from the Department of Health. So I won't say that we are totally ready right now at this minute to make that shelter do all of these things, but we're working on the capabilities to make that shelter do all of these things. So isolation and quarantine was really the impetus for purchasing this. Um, we need a deployable, it, it's very hard to find a place where you can isolate and quarantine people. I'm sure many of you have been through this in your respective communities. So DOH wanted to have an asset that we could deploy to any community uh, where this could be used for isolation and quarantine. I'm not gonna read all of these. Again, you'll get the slides later if you're super interested, You know, come back to this slide. But there are many, many um, uses, potential uses for this shelter. So keep this in mind in your own planning uh, uh, processes and when you're ever in response. Think about these types of resources. So we have a new program at DOH. I'm actually really excited about it. It's called Support Our Agency Responders or SOAR. Um, seems kind of, uh, I don't know, elementary, like, yeah, of course you support your responders. But DOH wants to take that to the next level. So we all signed up for these incident management teams. Yeah, right, I'll be on the incident management team. That sounds awesome. But then they call you to deploy, right? right? It's like, hey, we need you to, two years ago, I went to Nisbelum, right, for like a week. We need you to go to Nisbelum for a week. And it's like, oh, okay, I can go, oh, shoot, I have like two kids, and like there's a husband involved, and who's going to feed the dog? And like, it becomes less exciting to respond when they're actually telling you you have to go somewhere, right? It's one thing to like walk down the hallway to the emergency operations center. Yeah, I'm responding at my computer. You know, it's another thing when you have to go to a place and like be there for a while. So how does DOH really walk the walk of being a response agency? Well, we support our responders when they have to go somewhere or when they have to be stuck in our emergency operations center for many, many days at a time. And the way we do that or the way that we're striving to do that is by providing child care, by providing elder care, by providing pet care, by providing psychological care, um, and sanitation and food services while they're actually um, deployed or being active on the IMT. So we're starting a work group. We're aiming to have 50 people on this work group, not just from within DOH. I sent um, some uh, application materials this morning that you'll get after the meeting. We want representation from all across the state. If you know like anything about pet care for lots of people, please join our work group. I'm gonna be on the child care group because I think that's super cool and I'm interested in that. Um, so again, another way to demonstrate that DOH is really serious about being a response agency. We can't help you respond we can't help Region 9 or the state respond if we don't have people who show up to respond. And we know why people don't show up, right? The first thing in your mind, oh my gosh, how am I gonna get dinner for myself? I gotta get my kids from school. I gotta do this, right? It's like family and life logistics. We're trying to mitigate those. We're trying to solve those so that we have people who really feel like they can be all in on response. 
So this gets at some of my actual work that I do, which is medical surge stuff. Um, so we recently wrapped up a two-year project with a contractor called Russell Phillips and Associates. A lot of you, if you're with hospitals, you've heard of them because they've been to your hospital. What we did over the past two years is on on-site medical surge assessments at every single hospital in Washington State, all of them. And within each of those hospitals, we went to every single clinical care unit and looked at how that specific clinical care unit could surge to accommodate more patients. Some of them can't, right? And that's just the reality of the situation. Some of them can, a lot. Um, and so Russell Phillips and Associates, after visiting each hospital, made customized tools for that facility that helps that facility know how they can surge, where they can surge, what resources are necessary to surge. Because I, I have to, you know, big disclaimer here, we don't claim that when we walk out of the hospital and say, hey, you're a 150 bed hospital, but we just decided that you could like triple that, you know, we don't think that's an easy thing, right? So these tools, I should have brought an example, but, um, they, they are out there, Travis can share them, or you can find them on the website later, we can post them. It'll say, room 22, expand from two patients to three patients, and then it'll list the exact resources that you need to do that. You need a bed, you need some oxygen, you need a nurse, right? Whatever's needed to actually make that happen will be listed there. So at least you know what you're trying to get or what you need to start requesting through your normal resource request processes through emergency management up to the state, to DOH, however that works. So this is a really robust set of tools that can be used at the facility level. It can be used by your healthcare coalition, by the region, by the state, to really understand what medical surge looks like in this state. Well, you know about DMCC hospitals, the Disaster Medical Coordination Center hospitals. Ed mentioned them at the start of today's meeting. They help make patient placement decisions to get patients from a place of medical surge to a place where they can, or pardon me, from mass casualty incident or hospital evacuation to a place where they can get appropriate medical care, we hope, in an appropriate amount of time. So these resources that we created for every individual hospital wrap up into a really nice toolkit that we can use at all of our DMCC hospitals all across the state to help them perform this function for you in a more efficient, coordinated, organized way. So those trainings have been going on for the past few months. They're happening in Spokane next week at the DMCC hospitals in Region 9. Um, and so what those DMCC hospitals have is surge information for all of the hospitals in the region that they serve. And then our state DMCC hospitals have this information for every hospital in the state. This is how we can help make medical surge happen, again, in a coordinated way. It's really all about getting patients the right care in the right amount of time. And this toolkit is gonna help us get there and the training that accompanies it. So uh, really good work uh, that's wrapping up here. Blood center coordination. You know, there's a lot of state associations for nurses or uh, for kidney dialysis, not exactly a state association, but a, a group that pulls kidney dialysis together and, and other sectors, long-term care, uh, ambulatory surgery centers have WASCA. Blood centers don't have that, right? There's not a structure, there's not a state association that pulls blood centers together so that they can coordinate, so that they can talk about sharing resources or being active in response. So this is a, a hole, a gap, um, that I've been helping to fill for the past year. I've hosted, I don't know, maybe four or five um, just conference calls with the blood centers, but they, ha they had never been able to do that before. They kind of, like the medical directors sort of knew each other informally, but they'd never all even been on a phone call together before. So we have really good information sharing. We also get our state epi on the phone and some folks from our communicable disease staff, and they share blood center stuff, I don't know, epidemiological data and stuff about infectious diseases and zoonotic stuff, and it's, I don't claim that I understand it. I just make the phone call happen. Okay, that's what I do. I set up a conference line. No, but, but really, um, we are helping to the blood centers to be more coordinated, and I haven't mentioned this to them yet, but what I want to do is get a memorandum of, of understanding in place between these blood centers so that they can more freely share resources between themselves. Um, if we had a shortage of blood products in Spokane, 
you know, what is our best avenue for replenishing those supplies. So our Disaster Medical Advisory Committee, or DMAC, is a group of clinical experts from across the state. Some of them are in this room. Um, they really are from all areas of the state. They get together uh, quarterly and it's, uh, talk about crisis standards of care and catastrophic planning. This group exists to advise our Secretary of Health in making really difficult decisions during an emergency response. So we're really excited about this group and the work that they're doing. They're taking on something very, very complicated um, and uncomfortable to talk about. Crisis standards of care is not something that anyone's really excited to talk about, but we will talk about it more in two slides, I think. We also have a hospital capacity work group that's led by our state health officer, Dr. Kathy Lofi. Uh, this is made up of DOH staff, hospital representatives, again, from across the state, including here in Spokane, uh, the Washington State Hospital Association, the Healthcare Authority, Healthcare Coalitions, and others. This group is meeting actually tomorrow um, in Seattle. We've met a, a few times. It's, it's more of a work group. And so what we're trying to understand is what other pervasive factors that lead to sort of chronic medical surge. Um, I'll talk about this on a future slide as well, but if you recall the 2016 slash early 2017 respiratory illness season, a lot of hospitals were crippled and like it wasn't even that bad of a flu season. The um, immunization, the shot was like pretty on point for that year, but hospitals are busy places every single day and it didn't take much of a surge for them to really feel that crunch, right? So we're trying to understand how do we help hospitals not be in this constant state of surge, not be in this constant state of people in the hallway and borders in the ED and I can't get this guy out because he doesn't have the right insurance and whatever, right? Um, we're really trying to get the right people together to talk this stuff through. So I'm very, I'm, I don't know that we'll have it like all figured out by the time this respiratory illness rolls around, but we're, we're working on some stuff. And again, getting the right people in the room really makes a difference. So crisis standards of care, we are wanting to develop an ethical framework to guide decision making around crisis standards of care. I'm sure you've heard the example before, you know, you have three patients who are going to die if they don't get a respirator and you have two respirators, so what are you going to do, right? How do you make the decision? What guides that decision making process? What we're developing will not be prescriptive, and so we want to understand the various cultures across Washington State and the community perception around informed decision making for crisis standards of care. This work has been done, we're not like inventing this, this has been done elsewhere um, in the country, this has been done elsewhere in our state. King County did a very robust series of community engagement meetings uh, several years ago. The meetings that we're hosting, none of them will take place in King County because like didn't they're done that so, right, so we're going to go to other parts of the state Spokane is one of those places rural and urban parts of the state so, so those collective comments and best practices will inform that ethical framework that we'll be developing I mentioned inclusive planning as one of our strategic plan uh, focus areas and we we have really three people in emergency preparedness and response who focus solely on inclusive and equitable planning for vulnerable populations. We're working on getting some of our own plans up to speed. We have plans that have been around for a long time that maybe didn't um, focus on these areas as much as they needed to, so we're working on that. Trevor Covington from our office, he's super awesome. He's very, very good at inclusive and equitable planning um, topics. He has a history with uh, the Red Cross, I believe, and um, is very interested in serving as a resource out for you and folks across the state. If you have any needs or any concerns or questions about inclusive and equitable planning, please contact Trevor. Um, he was so excited that I would be mentioning his work to you today, so please don't hesitate to reach out. He's also a member of the Inclusion and Equity Subcommittee, which is led by the Emergency um, Management Division. Their job is to advocate up regarding policy issues to support um, inclusive and equitable planning. Yes, thank you. Um, and to serve as a resource out. So again, Trevor is there. If you need any help, please reach out to him. So we can't do any of this work unless we have the plans to support. I'm not going through this. You can look at the slides later. We have completed a bunch of plans. We are in the process of completing a bunch of other plans. And then there's some other plans that we haven't even started yet. 
right? So you can check those out if you want. I just want you to know that they're out there and that if you need any of those plans that we didn't talk about, you can reach out to us and we will send them to you if they're done. If they're not done, you'll have to wait a bit. Okay, so Michael Lair, I mentioned, deployed down to Hurricane Harvey as one of our four DOH IMT members who went down there. He shared with me some of his thoughts um, some of his lessons learned from being at that response. These next slides are really wordy. And the reason they're really wordy is because I don't want to misrepresent what Michael said to me. I don't want to be misinterpreted. So you'll have these words on these slides when you want them. I am going to kind of read a bit. I'm sorry. So what he said was that Har Harvey highlighted the interdependence of healthcare systems the sectors, the facilities, and the supporting infrastructure that keeps our communities healthy every day. And during a disaster, that interdependence is highlighted, right? It only grows because your facility can't do what it does on a normal day. You need all of these other partners. So healthcare preparedness programs are structured differently in every state, right? Some states are home rule, some states there's not even local health jurisdictions, it's all run by the state. Some states, it's only healthcare coalitions and no one cares about the state. It just goes all different ways all over the country. But Texas happens to have a nice model that revolves around the interdependence of healthcare systems, sectors, and organizations. I wanna pause here, this is me editorializing on Michael's words. Um, I don't wanna say that we should be like Texas, right? I think there's a tendency to like, I saw a new thing and we should totally be the new thing. That's not what I'm saying. I don't think that's what Michael's saying, but there are lessons to be learned. And Texas's focus on the interdependence of healthcare systems and sectors and organizations is something that we should all look at. So this is really important because it recognizes that our healthcare preparedness program in Washington state has to evolve the same way that healthcare delivery is evolving. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. So when we have an, an incident, it could be an earthquake, it could be a severe storm, it could be a pandemic, it has ripple effects across the entire state, right? When there's a shortage in one area, we're feeling that everywhere. Our threat environment is becoming ever more complex. We have a healthcare system that is less and less tolerant of disruption. You're relying on just-in-time inventory. You're relying on just the right number of staff to get the job done. You're relying on just the right number of beds, usually not enough beds, right, to take care of the patients that you have. There's not a lot of margin for error here. And again, that was highlighted to us during the respiratory illness season last year. The question we kept asking was, why is this such a big deal? This isn't a bad season. But hospitals are pushed and pushed and pushed every day. And that respiratory illness season asked them to push further than they were able to. We shouldn't be in that place. So how can we help not be in that place? So for those reasons, it's really critical that we structure our preparedness program in Washington State to best match how we really respond during disasters. Now, I keep talking about our preparedness program. What does that mean? Our preparedness program is the work that I do on state level capabilities and the work that my colleagues do on state level capabilities, but it also means how healthcare coalitions are structured across the state. You guys, of course, are part of the Region 9 healthcare coalition, right? The 10 counties and three tribes of Eastern Washington. So how do we best structure healthcare coalitions across the state to reflect how we respond during disasters, to focus on the interdependencies of healthcare facilities and sectors, that's what we have to keep asking ourselves. That's what we have to keep challenging you to think about. And ultimately, it's what helps us to be the best stewards of our federal resources that I mentioned, our manpower, and the work that we do. So we have some contributing factors here. We have higher expectations from our federal funders. We, we're funded, this group is funded by ASPR, the Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and Response. They are moving into a mode that is very prescriptive. It's very directive. It didn't used to be this way. If you've been around this work for a few years, you know that it didn't used to be this way. We had a lot more control over the work that we did. Now they're really telling us what to do. They're telling us to tell you what to do. They're measuring results. They're looking for accountability, right? I, I kind of can't blame them. I mean, they're trying to be good stewards of the funds as well, but they're re getting really sticky about measuring results, holding us all to performance standards. 
there's a lot less predictability around grant funding. We practically have a promise around dramatically decreased grant funding. Uh, so what does this mean for the work we have yet to do? We've done great work over the 13 years that the healthcare preparedness program has been around, but is it gonna be around for another 13 years or another three years? I'm honestly, standing here right now, 100% of my job is funded by this program. I can't tell you. I can't tell you if it'll be around another year. I, I mean, we gotta do what we can do to build these capabilities and to make them uh, sustainable so that we can continue this work. At the same time, we have distinct needs and challenges and priorities all across the state. What you need here in Region 9 is not what is needed in King County and is not what is needed in Snohomish or out on the peninsula or in the Tri-Cities, right? That's unique to Region 9. So what are we gonna do going forward? We have to organize around healthcare. Our past structure, our current structure is largely accommodating to government, right? Our public health preparedness regions follow county lines. Who cares about county lines? That made it really like organized, right? Because I'm this, okay, I belong in this group because I'm in this county. But it doesn't think about patient referral patterns and the spread of healthcare systems, patient evacuation plans, and interdependencies, right? These government lines don't think about those things. And, and it's not the right structure for healthcare anymore, for healthcare preparedness, for our healthcare coalition. So patient movement and continuity of care really have to serve as the foundation of our program. They have to influence our structure. We have to acknowledge urban priorities and rural priorities, and that those are different things, and that it's okay for those to be different things. Those of you in rural areas, you know we struggled with this for a long time, right? Just like what Seattle needs isn't what's needed in you know, Spokane. Well, what's needed in Spokane isn't what's needed in Garfield County. Let's not pretend that it is. We need to do the right work in the right place. We have to ensure that our health care coalitions have the resources they need. And we probably have to do some further restructuring of health care coalitions. When I came to this work, we had nine health care coalitions in the state. They were a exactly the same as the public health preparedness region. Two of those regions combined, we went to eight healthcare coalitions. This year, we've gone to six healthcare coalitions. I don't know that six is still the right number. There might need to be the need for further consolidation to stretch the resources, to maximize the work that we have yet to do. You know, Ed mentioned at the start of the meeting the multi-regional position. That's a shift toward further consolidation. We have, uh, great staff members based out of Spokane that are gonna be doing work for all of Eastern Washington. So we have to look at that model. Is it effective? Does it work? Does it serve healthcare the way that we need to? And does it result in good patient care? All right, healthcare executives must influence the policy direction of this program. Is there a healthcare executive in this room? Please raise your hand. Right, so this is a problem, right? So you need to go back, please, to your facility and say, you know what? You guys need to start showing up and inform this process because I can't just be the guy who does emergency management for our hospital. It doesn't work that way, right? We have to institutionalize this work in our facility and across our healthcare system. So I'm happy to be like the guy who does a lot of the work, but I need, you know, like you gotta like, the guy behind the guy, you know, you need your executives involved in this work. That's a Bill Joseph saying, the guy behind the guy. He used to say that all the time. So healthcare executives have the most influential, but often the quietest voices. Why? Because wait, where, raise your hand again, healthcare executives. Right, they're not here. That's why we can't hear them, right? So we need them to be involved in this process. This program is really focused on assisting the critical access hospital CEO, the nursing home director, the dialysis center director, the healthcare system executive, but they're not here. And we're here to help them with remaining operational during times of community wide impact. And so the question I challenge you to ask to your executives is, will our stakeholders, our community, the people who fund us, our patients, our customers, Will they be satisfied with the level of preparedness, with the level of commitment that this agency has made to preparedness, right? If our community needs us to respond, are we able to do it in a way that our community will say, yeah, they did the thing we needed them to do? You should ask that question. 
it's, tell them like this lady from DOH that I should ask. say, I'm not asking because I know, but like this girl from DOH that I should ask, I'm just asking because she said to. So you, they have more influence than they realize, right? Healthcare executives have way more influence than they realize. My boss, Michael Lair, is sitting there right now with his phone wanting to talk to healthcare executives. He actively seeks them out. He has done it in this region. He's done it in other regions in the state. History pretends the future. Washington is fourth on the list of major presidential disaster declarations. We already talked about the flu season. It was pretty routine, but it caused a significant disruption. Why? Because we don't have a lot of margin for error built in. We have to have a coordinated multi-sector healthcare response. Right? That means providence isn't just providence and multi care isn't just multi, it doesn't matter, right? We have to all work together when we're in these situations. In a, the event of a major earthquake, our state health officer, or, I'm sorry, pardon me, Secretary of Health, our Secretary of Health and Governor are going to face really challenging policy decisions regarding the this is super important, regarding rationing incoming resources and the need to adjust regulatory environment to match the reality. This is what's going to happen during an emergency. And so my question, these, this isn't Michael, this is me, and I want you to bring this back to your executive. So when we have our next disaster, will your executive have access to the information they need to make decisions? Will your executive have access to the resources that help them treat patients and keep the doors open? And will they be in a position, your executive, to influence those policy decisions? Right now, I would have to say no, because they're not here. They have to plug in. If they wanna make sure my hospital gets that oxygen, my hospital gets that response team, my hospital gets those beds, right? My dialysis center gets the generator in the water. They have to be part of the conversation. They are very, very powerful and their voices are missing. So please, bring if you bring nothing else back, bring this slide back and say this is coming from the Department of Health, Emergency Preparedness and Response, they need your voice. And if they don't have it, you're leaving it up to like me. You don't want me making any decisions. So they have to be there. All right, this is my email address. If you have any questions or comments, please email me. Again, you'll have access to these slides and other materials. Do we have time? Should, should I just walk away or do we have questions? Questions? Comments? There is, you didn't raise your hand, you stinker. I see you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I, ho I hope you get the message. It is so important that you're here. It's so, um, special that you're here and, and really, really important. So please let that voice be heard. Any other questions? Hi. Yeah, so the question was about the mods, the mobile all hazards. Uh, Yes, the shelter. Um, I can't remember what that acronym stands for. It's a big tent. It's a massive tent, you guys. Um, so is it stored on the east side of the state? It is not. I don't know what their caching um, intentions are with that because it is modular. That was it, modular all hazards deployable system. Um, I think there was talk about breaking that up into a few parts so that they could store like half of it here, half of it in Tumwater, where our primary warehouse is. I'll check on that and I'll get the answer back to Travis. Thanks for the question. Hi. Yeah. Right. Okay, so that question was about what are the decision factors around who, like what if 17 people request the mods? Who gets it, right? That's again about policy and allocation of resources. And then how long does it take to show up and how long does it take to set up? Um, so the decision around where to send it, right now there isn't a formal resource allocation matrix or decision matrix. Um, I can informally say it would be first come, first serve, but there's got to be a compelling need for it, right? I know that's not that's not the best answer, but 
Right. So we try to look at what is the area of highest need, the highest impact, right? Who has the wrap? Do you even have the ability to provide the wraparound services to support the operation of the thing is another determining factor, right? So then in terms of how long it takes to show up, well, if it's all stored in tum water, like this gentleman asked back here, you know, that's what, a six hour drive after we get folks together. If we get half of it stored over here in eastern Washington, depends on where you are, but you're down to like one to three hours. You still have to get the staff from DOH that's trained to set the thing up, which I think doesn't take very long. It's like a couple hours. Um, I, I think, you know, minimally, a 24-hour turnaround time would probably be the minimum. Do you have a question? Okay. Anybody else? What's that? If I just keep talking long enough, people just stop. When is it, when is it gonna end? Okay, anything? Okay, I'm going to wrap it up because you have other stuff to talk about. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Erica.